Today we're going to dive into a little bit of Metaverse news, and part of this will be some of the projects that are starting to show some very interesting moves. And I think this will start to maybe set the tone for things that are going to happen in this next bull run around Metaverse tokens and a lot of these innovative technologies, both from the gaming side, but also from just tech in general. So we're breaking that down for you guys today. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Bath. All right, so let's talk um, here quickly about a couple of key players here. One, of course, is Improbable and also Fortnite Nike. This is kind of going to be a, a narrative that we'll uh, paint around this. Let me zoom in on this tweet right here. This is Fortnite and Nike, uh, Nike uh, Airforia collab. This is a collab that's going to happen uh, with both the design skins, cosmetics, etc. We've started to see a lot of this kind of integration with Nike starting to roll out more and more digital goods, more and more digital applications, and this is no different. They're going to be essentially running inside of uh, what we'll see over on Fortnite. So th this could be a very interesting partnership because of what Nike has done so far with Artifacts. So a lot happening. And you also have to remember, this is all tied to dot .swoosh. So the dot .swoosh component here gets into the idea of NFTs. And this is where it gets a little confusing, but at the same time, the ability to essentially own an NFT within this platform, but yet have it extended into Fortnite. That's essentially kind of the cool aspect of how this is all going to work. The value proposition of this, again, is digital goods, but also within the game, digital value. So when you look at NFTs, things of that nature, especially in Web3, and how gaming is about to change in a very big way, this is a very interesting partnership, and I think one that we're going to have to watch uh, extremely closely. Uh, this will start to uh, flow a lot of aspects, I think, and make a lot more sense for a lot of other companies as they start to look at game integration. N uh, Nike has officially announced integrations of its NFT marketplace, .swoosh, with both Fortnite and EA. And the .swoosh platform operates, obviously, on Polygon, uh, further solidifying Polygon's position in the marketplace. Matic, obviously, was up a little slightly. This is something that we've talked about here on the show extensively, and that is the uh, involvement of Polygon and the token Matic, meaning that's how you're essentially investing in it. But if you're looking at other applications, I think Polygon, there's also Avalanche and Solana that are all playing in this era of trying to bridge this gap between Web 2 and Web 3. And this all makes sense because now many of the players are starting to come to the table. And with that, I've got a couple of clips here. I want to play this first one here. This is an improbable clip to give you kind of an idea of where all of this is coming from. Let's go to this clip. Why hasn't it happened yet? Why is metaverse like a really dirty word to all the journalists in the room right now who are giving me the stink eye? Well, it's because there are missing ingredients. Just like with the dot-com boom, there was promise and yet fundamental lack. The metaverse is the same. The first ingredient is experiences. If you take a crappy video game and slap crypto on it, it doesn't become good. We engaged in as improbable and as the soon to be announced M Squared Foundation is building a substrate of technology that can expand the scope of those experiences dramatically. So how do we measure that? One number. Operations per second. Remember this number. This number is the most important single metric when thinking about virtual worlds. It is the amount of information that can be usefully exchanged inside a world. No matter what promises some company makes or what hype they sell, if you cannot exchange in real time vast quantities of information. When I started Improbable, I thought it would take us like a year, year and a half to get to this point. It's been 10 bloody years and hundreds of millions of dollars. But we've gone from a few thousand operations a second to 20 billion operations per second. 20 billion messages a second on the back end. Soon, we'll be announcing ways to create interoperable objects that can be rooted in that technology but run anywhere, that go beyond what NFTs can be, which are simple markers of value, to actual functional tools built on open standards. And the question becomes, who will be the winners and who will be the losers? And I can give you a simple formula for who will win and who will lose. If you have a massive user base of fans, let's say you're FC Barcelona, but you have pitiful monetization per fan, 
pitiful engagement per fan. Virtual experiences are going to transform your business. They will 10x the value of sports leagues. They will vastly increase the number of buyers of high-end fashion. They will vastly increase the value of talented singers, Twitch streamers, YouTubers, content creators. And that's why at the final ingredient in our network, we've made sure that it's the content creators, the metaverse operators who own the value. You'll see how we plan to build that network, modeled a little bit on the European Union, with freedom of movement of people from place to place, with the ability to do commerce without having to worry about regulation from one world to another, but still with sovereignty. And we're going to be releasing all of these standards and all of this technology to everybody in a way that anybody can use, but which will work in an interoperable fashion together. All right, so he made a couple of points there I think are very important here, and that is this dynamic of what, you know, the metaverse or gaming to the next level, especially within brand integration. He was using football clubs as an example. This is really going to be interesting because it will kind of recreate how not only users and fans and, you know, retail customers, et cetera, people will start to engage. And because of the engagement component, it's like social media. If you think about it this way, how much more engaged people are in social media, TikTok, Instagram, et cetera, the activation, if you just look at the TikTok numbers on activations of advertising, it is somewhat 10x of that of the old digital, which was basically banner ads, et cetera. That is the difference because you're engaged into the content. Imagine if you start to ramp this up to the gaming element. This is a good example. This is Spatial OS. Uh, so this is GDK for Unreal now. It's available. There's one thing that they're starting to build. Let me kind of scan down here on the page, uh, which is this beyond a single server concept, which really starts to layer in multiple game engines. What it simply means, it's going to be able to create hyper-connected worlds within these kind of scenarios. So I want you to think about this. When you think about how gaming is going to function, the layer of aspects of social integration, brands, uh, possibly the interaction, that's why he was going back to this one number that he's talking about in terms of operations. That's a very important thing because as you get into the number of gamers, and we know that is, I think it's closing in on 3 billion, when you get the number of gamers and you start to integrate Web 2 to Web 3 with a lot of these integrations, that's going to be a very killer component to be able to do things like this. So this just shows you some of the elements that starts to play into this. And here's a good example of Zenith. This is kind of just showing some of where Improbable is going around ob open world VR. Uh, this is going to be going into action RPG combat. All these different kinds of functions within gaming ecosystems, again, all thriving in one simple universe, which is kind of the aspect that um, I think will at least get us in a place where we can kind of leapfrog. Key here is going to be who helps move the eight ball. You know, who helps kind of grow this market. We'll get into that. There are some very key players that are starting to show up here. But one, one thing that he has mentioned, uh, which is M squared. Now M squared is kind of this, you know, this foundation or this component that they're building on that eventually is going to be all, uh, the all encompassing component here that starts to really play into a much grander scheme around these layers, much like what we just showed you there, but also the capacity of being able to handle what they're talking about in terms of game operations, which is the amount of things that are happening inside a game couldn't be not necessarily just transactions. These are actual game operations. So a lot there, I think, with where M squared is going to be. This could really change a lot of what we're going to see in the future. All right, so the other aspect is uh, what they're talking about is M squared. So Friday, Unprobable, which is reported valued around $3 billion, raised its funding last fall, opened up early access to its M squared tools, to, which is going to be an open sourced MML to make it accessible for all builders. So essentially, this kind of opens the floodgates for the ability to build. And remember, cross capability is going to be very key here as we start to go into Web3. And this will be a big factor, I think, uh, going forward. When you look at just some of the integrations that have happened so far, you know, this is one example of uh, the other side. And these kind of things are going to be very critical because of the, one, the type of gameplay, also the interaction with NFTs, digital assets, and also in-game assets. In-game assets will also be a big part of this because you still have to remember Fortnite has already started to move in this direction, being one of the biggest ones out there. But there will be many Web2 games that start to create this crossover 
that I think is going to be very critical on how NFTs will play a role. Also, people are already build on, building on this, as you can kind of see right here within the ecosystem. We'll show you a demo towards the end uh, really quick. I do want to jump to a few clips, though. This is Improbable versus Fortnite. Let's go to this clip real quick. Fortnite, so let's use that example, where Fortnite's only able to have roughly 100 to 150 concurrent users. So what is it that you're doing differently versus some of these other platforms out there? Trying to make the game engine do all of this is, is a fool's errand. You know, you're going to need a very different sort of effectively back-end game engine that isn't going to run on a single machine, but actually run on a cluster of machines. And so you're going to need to build the distributed systems foundations to handle that. And it's taken us years to get that right. We use a machine learning approach to actually learn how people move inside a world to on the fly create more efficient bandwidth compression approaches. So we can get bandwidth down to 350 kilobits per second per user uh, if they download a client, which means somebody in the third world can you know, go to a stadium and be surrounded by cricket fans. In the other side demo on Saturday, you had full physics. You had colliding characters. We lessened how well you collided so that you didn't get boxed in by people, but it was, it was a full physical system. Voice chat, you know, we created our own custom solution to allow thousands of people to simultaneously speak in a spatialized environment where you can hear anyone, even people really far away, um, you know, blended into the environment on the back end. I'd say the games industry just isn't all that interested. They don't really care that much. Uh, you know, after we do events like um, like the one we did on Saturday and the previous events, the people that call us up are fashion brands, music companies, even bands in some cases, sports leagues, you know, newscasters, people who see the immediate benefit of bringing this type of experience to culture and to technology. The number one response I've had from the games industry is essentially, cool, you can do this miraculous thing. Why is that fun? There's no product announced or in the works, to our knowledge, by any game engine provider or cloud company that can support this kind of scale. That's not even an objective for a lot of these businesses, which is so strange to me. Yeah, I would agree with him. Is is this is the one thing that has to be solved, and apparently, improbable could be on this track. Now, granted, you have to still take this uh, with a bit of a grain of salt, and the sense meaning is is that this is a startup entrepreneur that he's built on this platform for 10 years, getting to this level, maybe it's finally getting to the stage in which the industries are ready for this, because this happened in the world of the internet, it's happened in the world of social, to where we really see the next generation of uh, integration. A lot of times that happens with the demographic shift that starts to occur, which is what we're dealing with right now. Next uh, clip here is Epic Games Store versus Metaverse. Let's take a look at this one. I also take an even more radical view, which is I just don't think stores are valuable. Um, you know, I know, I know you know the, the play happening with the Epic Store, for example, to compete with the Steam Store. None of that makes sense in the context of the metaverse, because the metaverse is not a, a collection of distinct commercial games potentially running on their own clients. The metaverse is a network of interrelated places, people, and things that are freely blending between those spaces. So I prefer a more a link-based discovery model, where actually social media is being used to you know, literally drop a link, come join me here in this spot, you click it, you jump into the world. Of course, people will distribute clients as well, but, and maybe even have stores, but more power to them. You know, that's not something I wanna take a cut of, that's something I wanna to enable to happen as much as possible. Do a meeting in VR. How much better does that meeting have to become? How much more comfortable, how much more relaxed before people will bother with that versus Zoom? It would have to be two, three generations ahead of, of where they are. Whereas if we take a look what we're doing with the M2 network and the cell, here's my cell, you know, you can hang out with The Rock live with a thousand other fans and hear him talk about his new movie and maybe he notices you and maybe he interacts with you and you just have to click a link on social media to do that. Will you pay me $1 as a fan of The Rock to go do that? That's a much easier sell because you're providing people with experiences they can't have somewhere else. We can't keep up with demand fast enough. We don't have enough people to service all the people that want to build content and we haven't opened up the SDK yet. We haven't even launched the token yet. So for us, yeah. it's now entirely about industrializing this process and, of course, making sure we nail other side um, to keep up the community confidence in, in our ability to deliver. Sure. So he hits on all of the things, the, the markers of something like this to be a success, and that is around experiences. And he's exactly right. The key here is going to be the threshold to entry, especially around the use case of the technology. I think about this in a very rudimentary way around Twitter spaces. Twitter spaces has been able to kind of bridge that gap with audio in a way that is very functional within the mobile device. It almost immerses you in, it could, now I'm not saying that it could take the place of podcasting one day, but it is very possible that that kind of experience is going to be a tokenized experience, whether through blockchain or some sort of payment 
And remember, what he's talking about there is stores, not necessarily products, now more experiences, which is a big thing for this next emerging demographic. That's what they're seeking out more so than anything right now is experiences. So I would agree he's on the right track here. The question will be is the integration of social media, how that'll play into it, experience, obviously content development and content creators will be a big part of this. This is our next clip and this is benefits of a blockchain network and why uh, all of this begins. Let's go to this clip. The other benefit of blockchain, the other very important benefit of blockchain is being able to allow for a fulfillment economy where experiences that require users to do labor become suddenly much more appealing and valuable. Great example is, you know, moderators in, in a concert, right? If we can put 100,000 people into a room and now we need moderators, who's going to pay the moderators, right? How do they get paid? How do they extract value out of the system? You know, how does that work? And blockchain allows us to basically disentangle the different functions necessary um, to be done to support the economy of a metaverse and put them in the hands of different companies who can use the blockchain as their medium of value exchange. Either you're going to do a Netflix and pay for all the content yourself or license the content from, from external parties and spend hundreds of billions of dollars recreating all of human culture in your own pocket or you know, closed metaverse. Or you're going to somehow encourage those people to invest that money themselves. And the only way they will do that is if they have ownership. And the only way you can give them ownership is by creating structures that allow for it. And that's why I see blockchain as effectively a necessary prerequisite for a credible metaverse effort. The M2 network can bring on these, we call them domain operators at a top level and give them the authority to run essentially their own metaverses. Now, underneath the hood, they've agreed certain terms in order to become part of the network. And those terms guarantee interoperability from the perspective of developers. You'll be able to take your character and your uh, visualization of that character from any world to any world at the option of the receiving world and the user. So that means you can take your customized characters from an NFT project on the other side. You can go to another world and vice versa. You can bring that IP back over. Um, and that's, that's de facto agreed. Like that's just the rules of joining the network. Yeah. So this is huge right there. What he just said is probably the gem of this entire episode. And what he means by that is essentially these destination points. And, and I will say you could look at, you know, Netflix. You could also look at Disney. Disney will have to start to shift some of this, which I think is where Iger is going with Metaverse. But the, the go, it goes back to this of the ability to create these new experiences. And more important is how the content creators are essentially going to utilize these tool sets to become, like he said, part of an owner of this, which gets into a very interesting structure because it is completely different than content flow of how we've done all of this for the last 30 years, how all of these different OTT systems have been built, how social media has been built, the web, all of web uh, has been built. All of this could really shift into a next generation of where all this is going, which I understand now why SoftBank is so dramatically connected to this company, and then this company, Improbable, has the potential here. This was coming in from just a crypt. Let me just show you a real quick uh, headline here. This is Board Apes, other side builder, Improbable. Now I, I'm looking at some fresh funding at a $3 billion valuation. Let me show you a couple of uh, items right here. Obviously, the, the hype here around SoftBank Bank Company is finally close to achieving uh, operating profitability. So to me, that is already significant because this market has barely even begun. I don't even know that it's even scratched the surface yet. It hasn't even come, to, come into the room. And the opportunity here that he mentioned just a minute ago is huge because of the amount of inbound. Now that's gonna be the question mark is how well they can scale to be able to onboard because there's gonna be problems with that. Kind of like if you look back on the world of social media when it first began, Twitter, even Facebook to a certain extent, there was a lot of problems with that. In Twitter, it was the fail whale. In Facebook, you couldn't get a page fast enough. Those kind of things could happen very closely here now in the metaverse side. Interesting uh, statement here. He says, we're now financially stable or sustainable business with really interesting growth rate because we found a product market fit in a brand new sector. And I would agree with him. I think this is going to be a new sector that redefines how brands go in, how creators go in, but m most importantly, how people engage in how people experience new evolutions, whether it's gaming, brand development, uh, experiences, all that is going to change if what we've been doing uh, for the last little bit of time here. I want to get into some other aspects around this, obviously with Andreessen. They've gone into this play, uh, which is a big way. And if you look at their active portfolio, there's a lot of companies within this that you're going to recognize, Arweave, uh, Avalanche, et cetera. 
but it's just laden with a lot of these. Now, I will say this, and many people, you know, kind of will argue this, but wait, Paul, you know, a lot of these VCs have started to back away from this sector. A lot of these VCs have said, well, maybe we need to slow down. We haven't necessarily seen this. This is almost a blueprint of 1995 through 2000, which was kind of the same exact thing where we saw this explosion, a slowdown, and then another explosion, which was post-2000, the dot bomb. That's where I think we are approaching right now of what's happening in Web3, Metaverse, and just gaming in general. The difference is back at that time, there was no predecessor. It was creating. Now we're trying to essentially emerge an old Web2 into a Web3. That I think is the big benefit here because a lot of these companies have already kind of gone in this direction. Let's go to this clip right here from Andreessen, uh, their VC strategy uh, plan right here. Take a look. Um, but but we approach it with the venture venture capital one one playbook, which is like, look, we're looking for basically really sharp founders um, who have a you know a vision and a, and a, the determination to go after it. Um, that basically where there's some reason to believe that there is some sort of deep level of technological economic change happening, which is what you need basically for a new startup to to wedge into a market. We go into every venture every crypto investment with the same time frame. We go into venture investing, so we go in with you know at least a five to ten year time frame, if not a fifteen to twenty year time frame. Like almost all, almost every investor in almost every asset class tra- trades too often uh, in, a, in a way that damages their returns. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and then as a consequence of that, what's happened is a lot of the fir- a lot of the f- investment firms that invest in crypto startups are actually hedge funds. So anyway, so that's all led to this thing where basically just these new crypto projects that the, 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 the tokens are traded too aggressively. They're, they they just in our in our model they just shouldn't be. They're not ready for that yet. And so so we we anchor hard on the venture capital model. We we treat these investments the exact same way as if we're we're investing in venture capital equity. We we basically buy and hold, you know, for as long as yeah. we can. You know, that's Mark Andreessen. Obviously, he's been in this game for a long time. He's built, you know, pretty much one of the, I'd say, the cornerstones of Silicon Valley in terms of VCs. So it makes sense because they are looking at it from a strategy that is very similar to startups. If Now, the question will be, and if you look at this next headline, you kind of go, wait a minute, this is a little bit over the top. SoftBank now, uh, backed startup and probable outlines a plan uh, for metaverse to rival Microsoft and Meta. And you think, well, oh, okay, Paul, wait a second. I mean, come on, we're talking about Microsoft. This is a 40-year-old company. You go down to Meta, even more important. And if you look at some of the things that have really transitioned this, and this is where I'm going, is it, it boils down to where are the users going to come from? Where's the engagement going to come from? If you look further into this right here, this is Google, NVIDIA, same article, and Japanese cloud gaming from uh, Ubitus will serve as technical partners for, uh, partners for this launch. This is all, again, remember, detailing the vision of the M-squared network right here and the interoperability of Web3. So this is going to be very significant because J- Japan could be the kickoff. This could become, think of it, the new Silicon, Silicon Valley. If you could imagine creating a place in the mid-90s and early 2000s that would control 95% of the world's technology, that's Silicon Valley. Could this be actually happening now in Asia? And that is what I fear the most, mainly because of some of the things that have been happening here, as you guys know, around just our own regulatory framework about we can't get our crap together uh, in in terms of being able to get digital assets underway because the technology is moving so fast, just like in the world of the internet when it was first born, that the regulation can't keep up. You would think we would have learned our, our lesson Unfortunately, it may be uh, a different here now because we've got companies and countries out there that have got alternatives. And that's one of the biggest things you have to look at. Further into this, this is SoftBank's vision fund. And this again, and and again, you could look at SoftBank. I'm just kind of scanning down through a lot of what they've got going, but you could look at SoftBank and say, well, wait a minute, this is the same company that invested in WeWork, did a full write down, absolutely imploded. They've lost a lot of money, but at the same time, this company, this investment firm, has been one of the most dynamic globally in going into innovation technology. And I think they are on to another big front, and this could be one of their key icons of it going forward. So just like most VCs, it's a lot of uh, you know shotgunning uh, into the wall because you don't know what's going to be the next unicorn. This might be one of them. All right, so let's go into what the Vision Fund is all about. And uh, listen into this clip, you'll like it. You are 
clearly one of the world's most successful technology investors and one of the world's most successful businessmen. Let me start by asking you about a fund that you are now raising, the Vision Fund. It's supposed to be a fund of $100 billion? Yes. Now that would be the biggest fund ever raised. So when you told people you were going to raise a $100 billion fund, did they tell you you were a little crazy? Well, some people said. You had a meeting with a man who was the deputy crown prince of Saudi Arabia, who's now the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. And as I understand the story, you went in and in one hour you convinced him to invest $45 billion. No, no, it's not true. Okay. <laughs> 45 minutes, $45 billion. Okay, sorry. Okay, I apologize. What could you have said that was that persuasive to get $45 billion in one meeting? Well, actually, uh, I said, I want to I wanna give you a gift. I said, okay. <laughs> now it's interesting. All right. <laughs> I can give you a trillion dollar gift. You invest hundred billion dollars to my fund, I give you a trillion dollars. <laughs> Not a bad return. I think the point here is pretty simple, and that is that where Miyamoto san is going is trying to recreate technologies, the tech stack really, all over again. It's like you, you created the internet from something brand new. And I think that's the direction that the Vision Fund is trying to go. Now, what this means is there's going to be a lot of interconnectivity, a lot of alignment within Web 3 and Web 2 that is going to start to create this inter interaction that we're going to see in this next major leap forward. AI will play a role, VR, AR is going to play a, a role, blockchain will play a role. All of this emerging tech is going to play a role in how the Vision Fund starts to piece together this puzzle that could very well change the face of the planet in terms of how we use technology, how consumers, individuals, businesses, literally every walk of life is going to be out there doing this. So it's a lot to be looking at. Now, just uh, further into this, SoftBank, of course, invested uh, 93 million in Sandbox. So this isn't, you know, Sebastian's, I, I know he's out there doing a big tour right now. But he's going through Asia. I was following his Twitter the other night. This is the CEO of Sandbox. And you look at Sandbox, and obviously that's going to connect you now to Anamoka. There's a lot starting to connect the dots here of where a lot of the innovation is going to be coming from. All right, so here is an example of what Anamoka is doing. Obviously, they had the Mitsui uh, partnership just recently announced. A couple of things here that I will identify here. This is the Japanese Business Federation. Uh, are calling for the adoption of Web3 as a national strategy. Huge. Uh, Mitsui has acquired diverse business development expertise to build up global businesses and all that in investment various, in various fields. And if you look at the fields they're going into, this is Web3 protocols that will be built around all sorts of areas. It's not necessarily just the infrastructure around what we're seeing in Web3 and in gaming itself. If you look further into the article, it says mineral, metal sources, re energy, infrastructure projects, mobility, chemicals. All of these things could eventually have some sort of role in a Web3 format. And obviously, this partnership is very critical because of the amount of companies that are being developed on this. So again, total assets right now, this company, uh, U.S. about $114 billion, revenue around $106 billion. So uh, definitely a, a solid company that would be very interesting because it could start to open things up into a lot of different industries overall. All right, so we promised you uh, to take a look at a little bit about this, uh, the improbable. So let me kind of just show you the construct here that they are working within. This is what you land on. And once you click this, it launches directly into the world. So once you're in there, you'll go into launch and you'll get a chance to see this is essentially what uh, they've been talking about is the innovation that r is really starting to happen. So it, of course, loads that up. Notice, of course, something down there in the lower left is uh, powered by NVIDIA. And we'll get into the interesting thing. This is all browser based. And what you're seeing right now is really just the whole load up of an integrated potential, we'll call it metaverse, Web3 environment experience that's going to open up the opportunity to really start uh, doing things of all sorts, whether it's building, uh, et cetera. I mean, there are opportunity here for brands, the experiences that he mentioned really start to play into it. So again, this is just a, a quick, you know, and it's already started. You know, the fact that they're already at this point is pretty Im impressive. So this, I think, is, is going to be key. Now, can they do it is the question mark. That's the really uh, big question mark that I think a lot of people are asking. 
Vision Fund is behind this. They've already started to do some waffling in the blockchain space. We've also seen the commitment toward building on innovation tech. So can Improbable make it to the next level and do what they claim to be doing, which is really preparing to kind of take over what was, you know, the internet uh, essentially is what they're going after when you think about AR and VR in the future of where that's going. All right, guys, we're going to wrap up now, but uh, one of the things, make sure and hit the like button on the way out. Uh, it is one of the ways we uh, get feedback from you guys. If you like these kind of videos, just smash the like button right now. It does help. And of course, if you're not in the diamond circle, make sure and get in there now. It's a free uh, member program. We send out additional podcasts, additional content, all based on the Diamond Circle. It's very simple. And of course, you guys want to reach me. It's out there on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.